Okay, I think we might get started. And um, welcome everybody to the um, JKMRC Friday seminar series for Friday the 8th of May. Um, my name is Nathan Fox from the Durant H. Bryan Mining and Geology Research Center at the University of Queensland. Um, in person today at the JKMRC, we have Professor Rick Valenta. He's the director of the WH Bryan Mining and Geology Research Center, and he's currently the acting director of the JKMRC as well. Um, thank you everybody online for joining us. Before we begin, on behalf of the SMI and the University of Queensland, we're based here in Brisbane and we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today and we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants. Um, today, it's a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Daniel Hastings. Um, Daniel is the Director and Principal Consultant at Quantified Strategies. Um, Daniel is a mining professional. He has extensive experience in exploration, technical services, mine planning and geology um, in both site-based and corporate roles. Daniel's worked on projects across um, Australia, Canada, the Philippines, and Africa. Um, and that also includes more than six years working as um, leading the geology and managing um, exploration at Octedi in PNG. Uh, Daniel's roles have spanned management, production, and planning, um, working on a range of commodities, including base metals, battery, met battery materials, and gold. Um, so Daniel holds a Bachelor's of Science in Applied Geology from UNSW, uh, a Bachelor of Law with an Environmental Major from Macquarie University, and he holds graduate certificates in mine planning and applied finance. Daniel is also currently undertaking a PhD at the Sustainable Minerals Institute um, in the area of system dynamic modeling, um, assessing the impacts of social and economic aspects on mining. Um, Daniel is a member of the OzIMM, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, and he is a competent person for Jork 2012 in mineral resources and ore reserves. So bringing all of that experience to the table um, in today's seminar, Daniel will be discussing the importance of cash flow modeling in strategic mine planning. Um, before I hand over to you, Daniel, I just wanted to let everybody online know if you could please ask questions in the question and answer section of the Zoom panel, um, and then we can moderate those to Daniel towards the end. Okay, thank you, and over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, so today I'll just give a bit of an overview on cash flow grade modeling. Uh, I'm not going to get into much detail, but just see how we go. Is that going to work? It's not going to change slides. There we go. So, what is cutoff grade? Generally, it, uh, it, it's what we use to decide what's ore and what's waste. Uh, people use this term quite a lot, but quite often they get confused between cutoff grade and break even grade, um, or sometimes even at what they call a cutover grade. Originally, uh, back in the 1950s, a guy called Mortimer, a South African guy, was probably the first guy that tried to define cutoff grade. Uh, he had two definitions, one being the, uh, the average grade of the ore must provide a certain minimum profit per tonne, and that the lowest grade of the ore must pay for itself. But, uh, we've come a long way from, from there, but uh, the, the problem you run into with these things is that uh, quite often in an operational sense, people start to say, well, you know, waste plus ore equals more ore, and that can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, I've seen that at a lot of operations. Um, especially when cutoff grades confused with break-even grade. Uh, a lot of companies go under when that happens because your average grade that you've been fed, fed to the mill starts to approach your break-even grade and then profit starts to fall. Um, so that's why a lot of times people will say, you know, the, the junior mining engineer is the one who decides the CEO's bonus. Um, it is important to note that uh, cutoff grade is actually a, an outcome of a planning process. It's not an input. Because um, what you want to do is you want to optimise your profit. Uh, and you have to go through a whole process to do that. And then the outcome of that uh, process will be a, a cutoff grade policy. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is that, is that cutoff grade is not cognizant of, of um, a couple of things. And that's, uh, that can be quite important. It's not cognizant of time. Um, and it's not cognizant of strip. They're the two main ones. Uh, it, doesn't also, it also doesn't provide information on things such as uh, the optimal process route in terms of a, a, a multi-route system. 
Um, so yeah, that's oh, there's no song written. Yeah, I think I think you must have hit the keyboard here by the I think it's a delay thing. Um, so the importance of cutoff grade policy. Well, cutoff grade policy uh, determines your your profit. Um, you can use it to uh, to assess value at risk. Um, and if you get it right, the policy right, you can decrease that uncertainty and, and it's used to increase return. So with capital allocation. Um, you see that that chart there with the um, the blue boxes. It's a very common chart. You see it mostly in, in estimation, grade estimation um, models. Uh, and if that uh, ellipsoid represents all the, uh, the blocks in the model, what you're trying to do is squeeze it so that you don't get misallocation. Uh, that's true for grade estimation, but it's also true for, for cutoff grade or block value estimation. So the more accurate your modeling, uh, the more you'll reduce the material that sits inside those blue boxes. Uh, and then that'll help you improve your strategic planning and uh, decrease risk. If there is a bias in the data, um, you, you might find that you're leaning towards one way or the other, perhaps more towards putting waste in the mill or more towards or, or to the dump. Um, there's information around uh, that can help you decide or help you understand if that's the case. Uh, those two smaller charts um, there are just great tonnage curves. They're two real great tonnage curves from uh, gold operations. And what they're showing, I guess, is that the top one shows that at the break even grade or at the cutoff grade, small movements result in large tonnage movements. So if your cash flow grade modeling is off, uh, it has a potential to move large amounts of material um, from either ore to waste or vice versa. The other curve uh, shows that down in those lower grade areas, there's very small, relatively small movements in tonnage. Uh, that's probably more representative of something like a uh, narrow vein gold project where material that's ore is definitely ore. Uh, and there's a clear distinction between uh, mineralization and unmineralized host rock. So looking at cutoff grades over time, originally people just used to use a simple cutoff grade that pick a point, half a percent copper or one gram per tonne gold. Then uh, it was moved, people moved towards uh, an in situ value that's especially useful where you had multiple commodities within the deposit. Uh, so you get a, a metal equivalent value. Uh, but the problem with that is that it's in situ, so there's no account of uh, processing, recoveries, uh, costs. Uh, then there, uh, people started to use a, a net smelter return. So that's essentially the revenue that you gain from the smelters or from the, the sale of the product. That includes marketing and logistics costs, but again, it doesn't include a lot of the um, operation costs. Uh, then people started using net smelter return per mill hour. What that does is that allows you to move your cutoff grade policy to your constraint. So you understand within your whole system where your constraint is and you try and maximize uh, utilization of that constraint. Uh, then there was net value with add-in costs, improved net value, so you start getting into a lot more detail, and then ultimately to a cash flow grade, which is a, a full value assessment. I'll just put uh, a number of papers there that uh, talk to all of these things. There's really not a lot of literature out there on um, cutoff grade, and cash flow grade modeling, uh, but they're the, uh, the main ones that are, that are out there. Uh, you'll see there's um, Brett King and Ken Lane, Jeff Whittle, all the names that you usually associate with this stuff. So that's just a little bit on, uh, on cutoff grade. And so just to show you why it's important. So this is a, an example. I pulled a couple of blocks out of a, a, a real model 
of the of the large operation, a, um, a porphyry copper operation. Uh, you can see here these two blocks, depending on what you use is your cutoff grade. It depends on which block wins. If you just use a straight um, copper cutoff, block one would win. If you use the straight gold cutoff, block two would win. If you use the copper equivalent or the in situ grade, then block two would win. If you went to a net smelter value, then block one would win. So you can see that as you go down the list and you calculate all these different uh, metrics, the block ranking, which block is better than the other, will, will move around. So this can be quite important because it will have an impact on pit optimization, pit sequencing, schedule optimization, stockpiling. I mean, in this particular instance, both these blocks are all. There's really no doubt that both those blocks are all, but the ranking of them is quite important. Um, there are a lot of things that change this relationship. Uh, a lot of inputs that uh, that will move these blocks around, uh, and that's why we we often talk about having a variable cutoff grade and a fixed cutoff grade. Um, you can't just pick a straight two percent copper that's a fixed cutoff grade. You want a variable cutoff grade that moves with the different attributes that are used to generate the metric that you use for your cutoff. Uh, this is another block. This is where it gets a little bit more important. So these are another pair of blocks that I pulled out of the same model. Uh, but these blocks are on the margin. So again, if you were to look at block one, uh, it's got a higher copper equivalent grade at 0.56, and it's got quite a large net smelter return per milliamp. But when you calculate its cash flow grade, it's negative, meaning it's waste. Whereas block two, which has a higher uh, copper grade, but lower copper equivalent grade and lower net smelter return per mill out, it actually does get designated as, as all. So that's where you have these, especially in, the, in a large open pit deposit, like a, a porphyry, uh, where your grade change curve flattens out uh, around the margin there, you can move massive amounts of tons by, by changing some very small variables in your, in your cash flow grade model. And, and this will impact the operation and the profitability quite a lot. So, what drives these variances? Well, this is a bit of a list that I just pulled together. Some of the inputs that we use in deriving a cash flow grade model. Um, the, the question, the first question that you have to ask yourself though is, is, you know, which of the inputs need to be accurate and precise and which just need to be fit for purpose and, and how much contribution do they give to the overall model? Um, I think most of these, these uh, variables in the, the centre box, the throughputs, the recoveries, the costs, uh, they're fairly well understood, especially by metallurgists and other various uh, people in the mining industry. Uh, costs are pretty well understood. The one that might be a bit more problematic are the regulatory constraints, especially in terms of how you get them into a, into a, a cash flow grade model. Um, but the things such as um, AMD, uh, where a, a parcel of material has a potential to, to create acid, um, you can model that and you can attribute a value to it. In some cases, you know, it may be preferential to process material that's slightly below uh, the, the cash flow grade cutoff uh, because it's um, it, it's more cost effective to do that than to, to treat it as waste because of the rehab costs. Um, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that if you didn't model it. So a lot of these inputs, um, although fairly well understood, they can get quite complex. Uh, and that's why you really need to understand 
this idea of fit for purpose, what's important and what's not. Um, the other thing that, that I thought when I put this list together is that all those variables look pretty, uh, pretty familiar. Um, and I thought that's where I've seen them before. It's all the uh, modifying factors in, in, um, in the JORP guidelines, which makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, that's how you go from a mineral resource to a normal reserve. You apply the modifying factors and you determine what's, uh, what's ore and what's waste. So in terms of cash flow grade modelling itself, right? so what we want to do when we produce a cash flow grade model is we want to model all possible outcomes for a block so that we can then make decisions on where that block goes. And I suppose I should just, just mention here, this has quite a large impact on operations. I've, I've done this on a number of different operations around the world, um, predominantly large open pit operations. But cash flow grade modelling as a component of the overall planning process, um, I've seen real swings in NPV or in value of, of you know, over a billion dollars. Um, and this type of work's led to investment by, by companies, real investment of hundreds of millions of dollars in various expansions or, or changes to processing. And it all starts with the, uh, the cash flow grade model and understanding where the value lies. So all these possible outcomes, from all these possible outcomes, a, a cutoff grade policy can then be identified that meets the business requirements. Um, it, it's not always maximising MPV, but it probably should be. Uh, you do get the odd occasion when MPV is not the objective function. But I'd argue quite uh, strenuously that optimising, maximising MPV should always be the objective function. Companies that don't have maximising MPV as their objective function quite often do run into trouble. Um, you know, there was a time there where uh, I know some of the gold majors focused on actual production. They wanted to hit certain uh, levels of, of uh, gold production and that became their, their primary driver and they ran into some trouble. Um, you know, there's uh, other producers that focus on mine life. Uh, there's other producers that focus on um, volume. Uh, you know they want to they want to own the market, flood the market. And it doesn't generally work out well. Um, like I said before, it's important to recognise that a cash flow grade model is uh, is not cognizant of time and it's not aware of the cost of exposing a block. Um, they they come later in the form of pit optimizations and schedule optimizations. Uh, line modelling can be problematic, but it's generally straightforward. Um, and those initial comments there, these I think are some, some things that you sort of have to live by when you're doing this type of modelling. Um, the first is, um, as George Box said there, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, it's certainly true of all models, I would suggest. Um, start with the end in mind and collaborate with the client. In this case, the client is usually the pit optimization. Uh, and the, the schedule optimization. So understanding what's required from the cash flow grade modeling uh, as, as inputs to downstream processes is very important. So that's why you need to collaborate with those uh, areas. Quite often you'll see in some companies the, the model, the geological models owned by the geologist and the pit optimization and schedule optimization models owned by the engineers and they don't really talk. They just say, here's the model and hand it over. That really doesn't work too well. You, you've got to undertake continual testing when you're building these things. Uh, I'm sure all the, the METs will be very aware that it's best just to follow the material flows. If you try and do things the wrong way around, it never really works out. And I would suggest to be as verbose as possible with coding. So keep a lot of documentation, a lot of notes, because you won't be the only person that, that works on this kind of stuff. And it's, 
it's terrible when you get these these massive models, cash flow grade model can run into thousands of lines of code and you're just handed it. They're quite hard to decipher. Um, I suppose one other thing is, is when George Box first said all models are wrong but some are useful, he actually, the first thing he said is, is uh, since all models are wrong, scientists cannot obtain a correct one by excessive elaboration. I think that goes to this idea of being fit for purpose. Yes, it can get quite complex and you have to model it, but try and simplify it as much as possible. Um, but a later paper, the second paper he wrote there in 79, um, I think he had a much better quote in there saying, since all models are wrong, the scientists must be alert to what is importantly wrong. Uh, it is inappropriate to be concerned about mice when there are tigers abroad. Uh, in all of these things, uh, you've got to be aware of, of what's moving the needle uh, and focus in on, on those things that actually do contribute a lot of variance. Uh, all the other stuff, just make it fit for purpose. Uh, okay, scope. So when you start producing a cash flow grade model, it's very important to understand the scope. Rarely you'll, you'll be required to do a, a model that only covers an operational department such as the mill or the mine, or environment could be uh, any of those. Most often you'll do it on a deposit type scale. You, you may do it on, a, on an asset scale where you've got multiple processing facilities across multiple deposits, but they're all in the same area. So I think things like coal or iron ore. Uh, sometimes it'll be done across a whole business unit where you've got uh, you know, a, a, a copper business unit that has multiple copper mines in multiple locations. Uh, and sometimes you can undertake cash flow grade modeling across a full value chain. Areas where majors have built uh, downstream processes like smelters. Um, it's interesting how the value of the material changes when you start adding in all these different processes. If, you, if you're producing a concentrate and you stop at the concentrate um, level where you're just selling a concentrate, as opposed to actually owning a smelter and optimising for the downstream as well, uh, you can get quite a lot of movement of material for and, and, and in block ranking. Um, so you really do need to be clear about, about what section of the process you're gonna model. Uh, also understand uh, the temporal resolution of your model. So a strategic mine plan looks at the life of asset timeframes and, and you, you need to use long-term averages. Short-term applications, so a cash flow model, cash flow grade model can be applied to short term applications. It's quite good to get alignment across all the different timeframes from grade control all the way through to strategic planning. Uh, but the short term applications generally require more detailed inputs and can vary a, a, a lot more. If you change your input parameters all the time, because I, I have been in operations where every month uh, they'll update recovery models based on the reconciliations. It just becomes unwieldy, especially when you're looking at the longer term uh, strategic plans. You just want to look at averages and look at the, the big changes. Um, and if you do change all the time, then there's a cost to that. Every time you change your cut grade policy, it's going to cost you in terms of how the operation's set up. I think I think people here understand the, the benefit of stability. I know a lot of metallurgists are always talking about keeping the mill stable. Uh, it's the same in the planning context. If you keep things stable, then it's it's much better outcome for the business. So underlying the cash flow grade model is the mineral resource model. Geological block models are usually built on a single lithology domain but can use other domains. I have seen on a number of occasions where the input information to the cash flow grade model is actually done on blends. They're not done on 
the domains used in the geological model. And that really, really hurts. You, you need to understand what the original, what the underlying data is and provide inputs that can be built on top of that. Uh, I know uh, metallurgical domains uh, is really where you want to end up, but generally there's not enough data to construct those. So you need to, uh, you need to be talking to the geos a lot. Uh, and again, you need to look at, at longer term averages rather than short term variances. So once you've got the block model, you need to then model the uh, process route. So this is this is just a, a flotation circuit. Uh, trying to model that in terms of material that's passing through it. it. You can make it as easy or as difficult as you want. Once again, it needs to be fit for purpose. What's driving the value? Is it is it throughput? Is, is throughput driving the value or is is copper recovery driving the value or is gold recovery, gold recovery in flotation, gold recovery in, in a gravity circuit? Uh, and, and again, this is where everybody needs to be talking. The Mets need to be talking to the geos need to be talking even to the enviros and the, the bean counters. The other thing is how do you simplify this up? How do you group it into uh, digestible chunks? Obviously you wouldn't want to model the roughers and the scavengers and the cleaners. You just have a recovery curve across the whole flotation circuit. I don't think there'd be any point in going any more detailed than that. Um, but then, then things can start to get a little bit more complex. This is just a, a CIL circuit. Um, here you might model the crusher area, then you might model comminution, then you might model the leach circuit. I don't think you'd model the electro winning or smelting or the inline reactor separately, it would all be in one. And then you start to get really complex. So here we've got CIL, we've got flotation, we've got an autoclave. How do you model that? And like I said at the start, you have to model the material going through every process route. So there might be multiple paths that the material can take and you need to model each one of those paths so that you can understand what is the best path for it to take and if you need to do trade-offs then what that trade-off is going to cost you. So again the, the metallurgical model needs to be fit for purpose with recovery curves. Um, I would also mention there that don't just focus on the payables, focus on the penalty elements as well. So many times they build these things and there's plenty of recovery curves for all the payables, but nothing for the penalties. There's also the distinction there between the, the metal recovery curves and mass pools. Um, I've done cash flow grade modeling on, on uh, systems where you, you concentrate up um, product and also where you concentrate up again and, and take the, the tails as your product. Um, figuring out where your fixed inputs are, a lot of different projects that have constant tails or constant concentrate grades. Um, when you see those you need to be able to flex them and do sensitivities and again find where the value is. Throughputs are quite interesting. Throughputs uh, should only really be the primary bottleneck. But quite often in an operation, they'll say, oh yes, our primary bottleneck is the sag mills. And then when you look at it, it, it actually might turn out to be the ball mills or it might turn out to be crushing or it might turn out to be the product pipeline. And if you don't have throughputs for all those different points, then you can't do a full assessment. And 
then you won't be able to you know, show or be able to provide justification to people as to why they should spend capital on deconstructing certain areas of their process. Uh, it's always good to have your costs down, especially fixed and variable. If you don't have fixed and variable costs, then you can't enable differentiation of, uh, of the throughput impact. Obviously, material that goes through a process plan a lot quicker than other material is going to have a lower um, unit fixed cost, and that's important in terms of determining its uh, cash flow grade. Um, the other thing is, is that the, the metallurgical modelling that's used in, in the cash flow grade model needs to align with regulations. Uh, a number of times the model that's provided is not actually the model that the operations guys use, and that runs into some serious trouble as well. Uh, and like all things, and like I've been saying before, if you keep on talking to people, then you usually solve all of these, these discrepancies. Um, just to give you a very quick example, this is how we do it. We, we do it in Python coding. Um, this is just a little bit of code setting up the recovery uh, inputs for copper and gold and fluorine. Uh, you can see there's the comments up the top, trying to keep the naming um, easy to read. And then this is just setting those recoveries for every block. Again, there's all the green comments down the side saying what's going on so you can read it quite easily. Um, This is, uh, this is looking at throughputs for um, two different iron products. Uh, there's a direct reduction pellet feed and a blast furnace pellet feed. Uh, different lithologies have uh, different throughput curves. Uh, also for different products. Uh, so all of that needs to be modeled. Like I said before, these scripts that, that we generate can run into thousands and thousands of lines of code. So they get they do get quite complex. Um, I've said this before. You, you need to calculate every possible outcome. Uh, then uh, what you should do, and we call it the U.S. Marines, uh, be the best you can be. Uh, where after you've generated every possible outcome, uh, you'd report it out as the best possible outcome for each block, and that will give you the block ranking. And then that block rating should be done, uh, it should be used for the pit optimizations. Um, the, the reason, the simple reason why you do that is that you have to plan for success. If you're not planning for success, then I don't know what you're doing, but it's probably not the right thing. Uh, inevitably, you won't uh, process that material if there are multiple pathways for material to be processed. Inevitably, you won't process that material in the best possible route for that individual piece of material because there's a lot of other components to the value for the business, um, opportunity cost, uh, the value of time, um, strip. Uh, the other thing that's really good is to pre-calculate all of this so that when you hand it over to the pit optimization, the schedule optimization, uh, they they don't need to recalculate it. The schedule optimizations at the moment can take a very long time. Even with the, the computing power that we've got at the moment, I've seen schedule optimization programs that take weeks to run. And if they have to recalculate all of these outcomes, these value outcomes for the material, it can really slow them down. Whereas if you've got a, a cash flow grade model that's holding all of those possible outcomes in there, then the schedule optimization just has gets to be able to pick and choose uh, which outcome uh, provides the, the optimal solution in terms of maximizing NPV. Uh, units, units are very important. Uh, units are very important because block models, which is the basis for the cash flow grade model, uh, are often coded for mining shapes. So, after you've done your pit optimizations, you'll have a pit, you'll have cutbacks, you'll have stages. And, and these have to be reported out as inputs to the schedule optimization. Um, when, you, 
when you export these things, it, these shapes, the, the, the material contained inside these shapes, it all has to be weighted correctly. Um, if you store in the model everything on a per ton basis, then it becomes very easy. Quite often though, we store things on a per hour basis or a total value basis or um, a, a dollar per ton or a dollar per hour or a total mass. Uh, you need to be very careful with the, with the units when you're moving around. Um, I've seen that cause quite a lot of trouble as well. Uh, there's also cases where, especially when you're dealing with really complex downstream processes, where you can't carry um, values in a, in a model, um, you need to carry multiple values to then calculate uh, you know, further downstream what that value is. Uh, so again, you, you need to be very cognizant, very aware of, of this and understand those values, those units um, really well because it'll tie you up. So things like arsenic grade of a, of a concentrate um, seems fairly straightforward, but if your concentrates volumes are changing with your block and your recoveries are moving in terms of your, your, your underlying payable versus you know, your, your penalty, because you're trying to increase your payable and decrease your penalty, and then you've got to slap them together and get a grade, that's based on a, on a product, it can be quite difficult. So just be careful of that and, and make sure that all the units are correct. Um, some other stuff. All right, regularization. Regularization of the model. So a lot of models are built as partial models or sub block models. Um, for the process of strategic planning, you, the models really should be regularized. So regularization takes, essentially takes into account all loss and dilution. But a pit optimization, um, not that I've seen, works on a, on a sub block model. Um, there's also uh, correlated versus disconnected price movements. Pricing is going to change all the time. And like I previously said, you don't, in terms of temporal resolution, you don't want to be changing the model all the time. But if price movements are correlated if you're in a multi-element, multi-commodity environment, then a price movement won't make any difference to your cash flow grade policy because your block ranking won't change. Block A that's better than block B will always be that, will always be better if the price movement is consistent. The problem that it happens is sometimes commodities will diverge. So in a copper gold system, for example, copper and gold track relatively nicely together and then they might diverge. Copper goes up, gold goes down and vice versa. And that will change your block ranking and that will require rerunning the whole process. So watch out for that. Uh, marketing. Marketing can be an issue. I've had issues with marketing before, especially where there's this transfer pricing. Um, where companies are trying to maximise profits through marketing instruments. Just be careful with that. And then uh, product specifications. So not everything is just a concentrate or bullion. Or, you know, sometimes there are other product specifications. So the one that, uh, that I've worked on most is the graphite concentrates where size distribution is a major component. And then also in garnet sands or, or silica sands where the actual particle shape can be important. Uh, but that's just a metric. You know, you have, you have measurements, you have a model, uh, you've just got to make sure that it flows through. So for example, here's a, here's a graphite concentrate. So this is using a, a fairly standard um, distribution model that, uh, that estimates the various size fraction of the concentrate. And this, this model actually had a very good correlation. Uh, I had an R squared of about 0.97, which is pretty good. And then uh, 
So this is about it. Traps for new players. Topography. You've got to watch out for topography. This, um, this can be a real, real issue. Mostly because of discounting. Uh, if you get your topography wrong, and this goes back to the idea of mining shapes and block partials and getting your tones all right, if you get your topography wrong, it, it will bite you because that's where you start mining and that's where the discount rate is most attractive and you're going to make the most money in year one. Um, and if you don't get the topography right, you'll either, over, you'll either overstated or understated in terms of value. And it will have a big effect. Uh, again, units, you've got to make sure those units are all okay. Beneficiation, beneficiation and ore sorting uh, is being used a lot more. And those type of processes can also be quite problematic in cash flow grade modelling. Uh, the only advice I'd give you there is, is follow the metal. Um, although that's good advice for the entire cash flow grade modelling process anyway. Uh, mass balances are always really, really good. Um, blending is another one. Blending can be really uh, complex as well. Uh, usually it is a capacity problem. The autoclaves is a, is a classic one. It's also a classic one in terms of, of value. Uh, a, a single block uh, of gold, let's say, it's easy to calculate the value of that. But when you require a certain amount of sulfur to activate an autoclave to get it to run, you, you'll see that there's waste blocks that actually have a value and enable you to access uh, all blocks that otherwise you would not be able to access. That's a blending problem and that can be very, very complicated. So you just got to sit down and think about it. Again, mass balances are good. And go with the material flow, start at the beginning and work your way through the process. Um, the last thing I'll say there is factoring. I've seen it time and time again where you get given a model, you put the model in, and the operations guys go, this isn't reconciling because their model has management factoring on it. or <laughs> Some type of factor that uh, they say, oh, yeah, no, the model says that this is going to be the gold recovery, but we don't believe it. We always get an extra couple of percent here or we lose a couple of percent there, so we just factor it. Um, whatever you do, just don't do that. If there, is a, if there is a bias in there and it's a consistent bias, then we should be able to adjust the model appropriately, not just add it back there, but redo the curves. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so I just encourage anybody online if you have questions, um, please ask them now. Um, Daniel, we've got some questions already coming in. Um, the first one uh, from Tim Napier Munn, um, just asking uh, that the met just commenting mainly that the metallurgical models that you have used seem quite detailed in your experience. Where are they deficient and how would you like to see them improved? Uh, quite often I've seen them deficient in terms of, of um, well, what, that, what generally happens, the best, the best sample that, that the Mets have when it's an operation is the mill. So they'll take belt cuts and uh, other samples throughout the processing plant and from that they'll, they'll derive uh, their, their curves or their throughputs. The problem is is that's, that's almost always uh, blended material. So they'll say this, this is 20% oh, SCARN and 80% porphyry and I say well that's fantastic but the underlying geological model only has either porphyry or SCARN. It doesn't, it's not a blend model. I can't really do anything with that. Um, it sounds quite straightforward, but that, that really happens quite a lot. Um, the other thing is, is throughputs. Uh, a lot of the time, throughputs are just a fixed value. Um, they'll say for this rock type, it's X, and for this rock type, it's, it's Y. Uh, I, I, I'd really like it when people have done a lot more work on throughputs and they can give you a curve. Uh, because that really speaks to value. It's, it's kind of like um, in a geological model, 
people spend a lot of time on the uh, elemental data, the assay data, and not a lot of time on the SG. But they both have the same impact to the model in terms of metal. So uh, METs will spend a lot of time doing recovery curves, and not a lot of time doing throughput curves, but they have the same impact, generally the same impact on the operation. Um, so that's probably the, the two main ones. Yeah. I think that kind of there's a, a comment here from Ralph Smith, just also, I suppose, feeding into that, just saying, should we also not model throughput rates, such as material, um, things that might affect throughput rates, such as material hardness, et cetera, and associated costs. So I think that you've probably included that as well in your. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should be able to do that. Um, the question from Paul Gow, um, he's just wondering, uh, he's, he thinks you mentioned that um, in some cases the cash flow cutoff is based on blends uh, with reference to domaining of this mineral resource model. Could you explain or elaborate on that? Uh, in terms of blends, I'm not quite sure. I mean, the underlying data, like I've said before, that come from the Met sometimes um, has, is, is blended data. Um, each block in the block model is, is only a single lithology. When it goes into the schedule optimization, obviously it's, it's blended up. Um, what, what can happen though, in terms of blending is, is like I was saying about the autoclave or another one, another one that's, that's really um, interesting is at Octeti, they have a pyro um, flotation plant that pulls the pyrite out of the, the tails after it's been through the copper concentrator uh, for environmental purposes. Yeah, that's, that's one of these regulatory um, things that, that you have to be cognizant of. But if I've got two blocks, for example, one block's got very low sulfur and one block's got very high sulfur. If I push them through, through the, the, the process, um, the high sulfur block uh, will, will hit the, will max out on the recovery and the tail coming out won't meet specification. It'll be too high a sulfur and tail. But because it's a capacity equation, the, the block that had very low sulfur in it, uh, you can use some of that capacity to, to take the sulfur out of the other block. So it's a blending issue. Together, the two blocks are fine. If you treat them separately, it doesn't work when you model it. That, that's the blending problem. So how do you get around that? What you actually need to do is you need to set um, multiple uh, outcomes for every block. So you say this is what happens if the block goes through by itself and and, and just uh, use the, the primary underlying curves. And then you say, but if I send that block through and there's a lot more capacity there, then I and I and I theoretically recover all of the sulfur that I need to, then this is the outcome. And then post cash flow grade modeling in the schedule optimization, you can aggregate up all of these things to a total volume. Um, and use that as a constraint on the process. So, uh, it, it, again, it gets very, very complex and it takes you a long time to get your head around it. But um, yeah, that kind of thing can be done. The, the other one, of course, is the, the autoclaves where you've got, you've got in, in a gold uh, system like we're here, for instance, you've got the gold and the autoclave, you've got the oxygen and you've got the, the sulfur and you need to get them all right to have the thing work properly. Uh, it's a bit hard to model in a block model that's just got a, a single uh, lithology in each block and a single value attributable in terms of revenue. How do you, you know, say that a block that's got sulfur in it that's required in the autoclave to make it work properly but it's not actually contributing any metal? How do you give that value enough that it's actually determined to be ore and not waste? So in a kind of related subject, um, as it does Douglas um, as in he, just wondering, in the conventional block model, um, if they consider dollars per block, typically, um, should we consider, in your opinion, um, dollars per tonne of concentrate produced per block or dollars per hour needed to process the block? Should we be um, attributing uh, these blocks in different ways in the future? Oh, I certainly would. If, if you're, well, if all of your material, like I say, different deposits have, have different... Um, different requirements. If you're certain that all of your ore material is always ore and always going to be ore uh, because it contains so much value and there's a clear distinction between ore and waste because of the, the mode of mineralization perhaps, then you don't really need that complexity. But if, if you have 
areas of low grade and the grade change curve is such that that moving the cutoff does pull material in and out quite a lot, then I would very highly recommend that you go to a complete uh, cash flow grade model. Uh, you can do it in stages. You can go from a dollars per tonne. Uh, if you go then to a, a, a net smelter return per mill hour or per hour of your, your bottleneck, uh, then you'll start to see you know, where you can optimise the system and where you can add more value by really utilising that bottleneck properly. Um, and if that bottleneck's stable, then fine, if it's moving around, you need more and more data to, to see where that bottleneck actually truly lies and what you can do to um, deconstrain the system. Thanks. Um, Michael Horton was just wondering if you could expand on the effects of uh, topography and how it can become a big problem. I'm sure you've got a lot of experience in this. Okay. So, um, so if you, uh, for instance, are working on a model and you take the view that you're just going to do block in, block out, so either you take a block or you don't, uh, but the topography actually cuts a block in half. Uh, if, you, if it cuts a block at 51%, let's say, 51% um, being in situ and 49% is actual air. If you do block in, block out, then you're going to take the entire block. Um, now, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but it sort of shakes out in the wash, you know, it's, it's slippery dips and roundabouts. Uh, it doesn't work out that way because you're actually attributing all this value to the 49% that's, that's, that's really air, but you're taking that value. And because you, your schedule starts at the top, at the topography, you're adding in those additional tons in year one, so they're not discounted. So you get you get really uh, wrong uh, answers in years one and two. So so you really need to adjust for topography properly uh, and make sure that you're carrying the right amount of material. Um, otherwise, you you will win. You will run into trouble. You'll you'll have a year one that has very low material movement but meets all of the requirements in terms of, of metal production or vice versa, you'll have massive material movement in year one and you won't be able to hit your, uh, hit your targets. So that's all gonna be a topographical effect. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Joe Kakaza, um, just commenting that metal, metallurgical models are difficult or limited by lack of data, um, then how do operations actually develop the models across, um, I assume across an asset, or how do they actually develop these models when they are lacking data? Uh, lack of data is, is not necessarily a, a problem for developing a model. You build the model based on the flow sheet, based on the material flow. If you don't have data, if you don't have data for a certain input, then you go and ask them and say, well, what's the best guess, or what data do you have? Uh, and then you do a sensitivity around it. And you might find that, that really they don't need that data because it doesn't move the needle very much. Or if it does move the needle a lot, then you go back to them and you say, look guys, this is a serious, serious issue. Can you please go and spend some money and try and narrow down this input because you are having a massive effect on the project or the operation. Um, but you always start with what you've got and you do the best you can. Uh, and even that, I would suggest moving from, from a, a, a simple cut grade dollar per ton or in situ value to a cash flow grade model uh, will add value. Excellent. Um, quite an important point here from you and Sellers, uh, Mining3. I suppose it's going to become much more relevant um, moving forward is he says that you stated that it's best to keep the cutoff grade constant, but then how do you cater for selective mining approaches? An example of grade engineering, well, I suppose that cutoff grade is constantly changing depending on what you do with that material. Yeah, well, um, I suppose I didn't explain it really clearly. A fixed cutoff grade um, historically was, was simply, um, you know, uh, a grade field. So you've got 0.5% copper or, or three grams per tonne or whatever it may be. When you go to a variable uh, cutoff grade policy, if you use cash flow as your cutoff, so anything that's positive in cash flow is or and anything that's negative in waste, it's fixed in that in that that zero point is that this is the is the um, point at which you differentiate between ore and waste but it's not fixed across the deposit every block is is calculating its own cash flow grade and and you can't um, 
you know, it, it is a variable model because like I showed in, in those um, slides where I had the, the two blocks, you know, one has a higher copper equivalent than the other, um, yet one was ore and one was waste and it didn't necessarily make sense. So that's the kind of variability I mean um, in terms of the, the fixed cut grade is if you, if you calculate it all out, the, the fixed portion of it is if you make money, you're ore, and if you don't make money, you're waste. Um, sort of helps. <laughs> with that in mind, I mean, how do you think um, approaches to modeling uh, deposits, even from an exploration perspective, and then resource development, when you try and build a joint compliant resource, do you find that there may be some deposits that don't, uh, on paper, have look as economic as others, but when you actually start mining them, the opportunity costs come in and the technologies you apply can actually transform these into economical mines? Yeah. Um... Again, it's got to be fit for purpose. So you start with what you've got, you build them as simply as you can, and then as you get more information, you, you add more in. You, you, can't, you can't make them complex just for the sake of it. Um, but what I have seen is that when you actually do get all of the detailed data, like I said before, I've seen the needle move on projects um, over a billion dollars and, and then gone on to show that that's a real movement. This is not something in a development case that we're looking at. These are real operations that are operating and then, then that's led to major investment um, and, and real changes in terms of their, their cash flows and their profitability. Um, and I've seen it go both ways. I've, I've seen it add a lot of value and I've seen it destroy a lot of value or at least destroy what they thought was value. Um, so yeah, if you don't have the information, you just do the best as you can. You, you, and, but as you get more and more information, you need to keep on updating this process and get better and better at your, at your model. If you, if you don't have enough information to do a, a cash flow grade model, then just do a net smelter return or just do, a, do an in situ value. And that's the information you've got. And you've got to make the best decision you can based on that information. Okay, well, I think um, with that, thanks again, Daniel. Um, really appreciate your time this morning and the interesting talk.